Happy Sabbath, good morning, good evening, good afternoon from wherever you're joining us from Karibu Sana to another Bible study that we are still doing through the book of John and our theme this quarter has been the themes in the book of John and today we are on lesson six more testimonies about Jesus. Just a reminder that last week we were looking at the testimony from the Samaritans at Jacob's well through the Samaritan woman and even the eventuality of it. Today we are focusing on more of these testimonies from various quarters and as always, we are a team here to do this study together with you. So we ask that you kindly take your Bible, take your quarterly lesson, and have the joy of sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning about his truth. And who knows, you might be just the next person telling more testimonies about Christ. Uh, before we delve into the lesson of this week, I'll ask that scholar, please pray for us. Let's believe and pray. Our Father and our Lord, we come before your presence this Sabbath. We are grateful for the gift of life and for the sustenance upon our lives. And even as we delve into the study of your word, we ask that you may guide us, and that you may infill us with your spirit, that you may grant an understanding uh, unto the study of your word, and may your blessing rest upon your children is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, um, even as we are about to start our study and ask that we say our names and the lesson that we'll be taking us through, starting with you. Praise God, Amen. children of heaven. Mm. This morning, um, my name is Crispal Begera. Uh, we're going, I'm going to take us through the humility of, the, of soul. John the Baptist testifies again, mm. and also the Wednesday part, which is the witness of the Father. Amen. 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 Good morning and happy Sabbath. Uh, my name is Marion and I'll be taking us through an und a new understanding of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Nsongo Raphael. I'll be looking at acceptance and rejection. Amen. Uh, I'm Ramona Pio. I have this privilege of taking us through this study. And apart from that, I'll do the witness of the crowd. So it's, as you've heard from the titles that we've mentioned, it's one interesting study, one that you do not want to miss. So we invite you even from the, uh, as the online congregation to be part of our lesson study through your comments, which we are very grateful for, by the way, through sharing the link of the YouTube channel to other friends, relatives. Do not enjoy the words of God alone. We learned from the Samaritan woman that the moment you find the Messiah, you call everyone from your village to be part of it. So, more testimonies about Jesus. Our memory text comes from the book of John, chapter 12, verse 32, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. It says, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. It's such a wonderful, powerful text. These are the words of Jesus that he's talking about. That if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all, men, all people, some version says, all men to myself. You know, Christ is not just saying things about himself to make himself look like he's all glorious, all glamorous. He actually means these things and he has an objective. The objective is to draw more men to him. He remember, his mission was to come and reconcile us, the fallen children of God, back to his father. We had, sin had entered through this world uh, through one man. See that sin had entered into this world through one man and through this, through another one man who is Jesus Christ is coming to reconcile us back and that is, has been his mission. So through the healing of the man, the man at the pool of Bethesda that we looked some time back, uh, the feeding of the 5,000 and even his eventual 
um, rejection by the same multitudes, and then also the, just the resurrection of Lazarus, it creates faith for some others because through these miracles, people were drawn to Christ. But again, it is also causing division. And so again, today is, we are going to look another um, episode of what drama, quote unquote, uh, only that um, it is drama because people want to make it a drama, you know, uh, to bring hostility where there should be none. But as we know, where Christ is, the devil also wants to fight for his own people. And he's also trying to bring conflict in church. And this week we are going to look at the incidents and some of aspects that show who Jesus is, that reveal who Jesus is. And John really endeavors to try and reveal to us that, you know what, this is the Messiah, to leave us without a doubt that this is the Messiah that we should, we have, they had been waiting for during that time, and for us of this time, that we should believe in him, that we may have everlasting life. And the first witness is John the Baptist. Remember, we've been saying John the Baptist is the forerunner or was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at him once again. Through the title, Humility of the Soul, John the Baptist, he testifies again. By this time, by the way, you sh you, you'd imagine that he should, be, he should have uh, exited the scene, exited the stage. You know, your work is done. Why are you still here? And Chris Pyle is going to tell us why is John still here. Um, John the Baptist um, comes onto the scene um, in John, uh, from the beginning actually of the life of Christ. He was the forerunner of Christ. And having uh, been, um, such, uh, as it were, the, the, the Elijah who was to come in the last days as was spoken about him and his work in the book of Malachi, we shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. He was like the connecting link between the Old uh, Testament prophecies about the Messiah and now when Christ comes to the scene. So having preached about Jesus and even having had the privilege of baptizing Jesus, remember when he comes to Christ on the on the shore of the lake and Christ uh, and he's baptizing and then Christ asks him to baptize him and he is baptized and then something happens there that we're going to see how uh, the father and the spirit testify about Christ so John had had this privilege of really um, testifying or giving witness a very powerful witness of the Messiah because of all the prophets who had testified, who had testified about um, the Messiah, John was the one who actually lived to see the Messiah. So his testimony is a very powerful uh, witness. And, and, and now it comes to the scene that in John chapter 3, uh, from verse 25 to 36, we are told that we find a scene there that there is a question between his disciples and a Jew concerning the idea of baptism. And they come and ask him, the one whom um, you baptized at Jordan is now having, and, and you bear witness that he was the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God in whom, from whom, there is who takes away the sin of the world. So John is asked the question. Now the same uh, rabbi, the same teacher of the law, is now baptizing beyond Jordan. Mm. It's as if they want to ignite a certain controversy uh, between John and and uh, him himself. So what Christ? What then? Now they expect John to answer that question, the controversy, and uh, uh, the controversy that has been ignited in their minds. But it seems John understood the realm. He understood the, 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 
position he held in the work he had been called to do. So in John, John answered in verse 27 and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. Basically he's telling them, the work that I'm doing, I did not originate it. I was a partaker of what I received. I did not originate that which I do. And then he goes on to tell them that I am not the Christ. And that had to come out very clearly because of the powerful witness that John the Baptist had made to the point where men thought that he was actually the Messiah. And so he had to clarify it clearly to his disciples. And, and then he gives out those powerful words um, in verse 29 and 30. He that has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom which stands and hears him rejoices because of the bridegroom's voice. And then he says, this is my joy, therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. What a condensation of John the Baptist. He might have been the natural reaction to be envious, but this is not the case for John. He says, I am not the Christ, and Christ must increase, but I must decrease. And you see, sometimes in ministry, we sometimes want to overshadow the object which God has called us to achieve. We forget that and Christ, this morning, in the example, in the, in the powerful you, you, uh, condensation of John the Baptist, so that Christ might stick out. Christ's um, identity as the Messiah, as the one who now must occupy the position, the throne must appear. And I think that is the powerful lesson we learn here, in, 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 in that Christ was the Messiah. And John has accepts his position he accepts his position as a friend and he points to that idea and he points he knows that he's just a pointer to the messiah pointing to the he who will come amen thank you so much um Chris Paul, for letting us understand that john the baptist had to make sure that it comes out clear that my role here is really to just be a forerunner. Yeah, and I am done with that. So I decrease that Christ may do what increase. And that brings me to a question on Songo. How can we learn this lesson of humility? How do we learn from John about humility before God and man? And how can we be how can we learn to be this example that John has presented to us? Mm, yeah, I think uh, that's a very significant uh, question. In uh, verse 24, we are told that John was not yet in prison, okay? So this oh. is a time when both of them were active uh, in ministry. And it seems as if um, the disciples had a competitive spirit within them, like mm. my teacher is better than your teacher, you know, my class, my school, that kind of thing, which we, even when we were, when we were young, um, we, we tend to compare a lot. But in, when it comes to a spirit, spiritual matters, and, and in general, a secret to humility is what John tells us in verse 24 of chapter 3. He says, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. So with that in mind, then, if you have a great talent for science, for music, for art, for whatever it is, if you always are mindful of the bigger picture, that these are talents that somebody that God has given you, then for a fact, ne we will not be able to look down upon others. You know, um, in Swahili, sometimes we say, Ali Kupa, ni Ali Ninima. So, to, and, to, to, and to, uh, to a certain extent, that says that, at a, that there are some things which you have been given which I may not have, and there are some things which I have been given which you may not have. The way the, the divine uh, arithmetic with which God uses to partition and to give talents is up to his own discretion, and we may not truly understand it, but nonetheless, we should, ha having this understanding that nobody receives anything except it is given to him from heaven, then 
it, 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 it allows us to be humble with our gifts because we, we are seeing the big picture and we are seeing he who gave us these gifts. And so, like John, we shift our focus from ourselves to he who, gives, who gave us the gifts that we decrease that he may increase. Amen. And one thing that comes out clear too is that John was not doubtful of what he was called to do. John knew his identity in Christ. I think maybe perhaps the things that make us have this spirit of competitiveness is that we start being confused on who we are. We start being confused about our talents. We start being confused on our role to the body of Christ. But really, as Onsongo tells us, the bigger picture is the gospel. The bigger picture is the ministry. So will we look down on the competitiveness or we will, will we look up onto Christ who has given us all these gifts? Because what God has given us, for sure, it comes with a blessing. So will you start uh, thinking that your blessing is small and someone else's big blessing is bigger? Contentment is the word and understanding is another one. May we be content with the talents that we've been given our role in the body of Christ. And may we not be confused at any point about who we are in Christ, our identity in Christ. And we swiftly move to the other part where a new understanding of the Messiah. And Marion is going to take us through that. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, it is said broadly that a repetition depends in pressure. Mm -hmm. And so we will constantly keep seeing a recurring theme and one for us that is imperative for us to remember is everything points to Christ and ultimately ends begins and ends with him and so it is important uh, we look to what John uh, desires that us we, we may have a new understanding of the Messiah and so our scripture of consideration will be John chapter 1 from verse 32 to 36 which I will read in our hearing uh, reading from the King James Version, it says, And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he that baptize, which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamp of God. Now the background is, um, as we have said countless times, is the Israelite nation, and the Jewish nation had held to preconceived ideas of who the Messiah was to be. And we find this to be erroneous because they had thought of him as coming as a political uh, king to come and save them from the oppression of the Romans. They had felt the pinch of the Roman rule and they desired to be freed from that. And while that might, ha might have been noble, truly we know that that was not the aim of the Messiah. Because his role had been clearly depicted, it needed for them to have prayerfully studied the prophets and it, it would have been made plain to them. And to get rid of the preconceived uh, notions that they brought, they desired the Messiah to achieve, which was not in, in the plan of salvation as it was. The Lord truly desired to save them from the oppression of sin rather than from the oppression of the Roman rule. And I find that to be greater. And so when we see uh, John the Baptist coming in as the precedence has been laid about the humility uh, that John expressed, we now see that he carried a specific message. And you can recount with me that his, him, his was a message of repentance. And when you read uh, Desire of Ages, it points to uh, in saying that the people had gone for a long period without a prophet and they had been so dead in their sins and their almost as to say their conscience conscience was seared as with a hot iron and they had been dead in their sins and so when when John comes into the picture and he's crying out as as Isaiah 
brings it out in saying that he is the voice of the one crying in, in the wilderness, repent. And so he comes to the streets crying, repent, 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 and turn from their sins. And so these people, are, these people are perplexed at this kind of message. Their hearts are pricked, and some decide not to, to act upon that conviction, but others do. Because they still hold to some of these notions. You know, of the priest and, and the Sadducees and the Pharisees, it is said that um, when, the word, when such words were spoken by John the Baptist, it says the words much desired by the priest that Jesus would now restore the kingdom to, uh, to Israel had not been spoken. And so while they desired that John would say, there's someone coming and he will save you from, from this oppressive role. Such words were not spoken. And many, I would say, were greatly disappointed. Some perplexed, and I would dare say some were offended. They were offended of Christ. And so John, with his gospel, wanted to change the understanding of the Messiah so that they, would, they could recognize in Jesus the fulfillment of the prophecies regarding the coming king and what he would do. Because the work he was to come was a greater work. And we're going to look at that. I will take us back just in memory of a previous lesson. We talked about the role of Jesus Christ as the lamp of God. Now we can see as John is actually recognizing him. And he says, behold the lamp of God. And remember we had said there were three S's to it. One we had said his role was one of servitude. He had come to serve the people. Second was a sacrificial role, and that is evidenced by him, as he said in Isaiah 53, 7, that he was, uh, he's brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And thirdly was the role as, uh, as a salvational role, he was to save his people. Beautiful words are said of uh, Jesus Christ when you read the Desire of Edges, that um, of his personage, uh, it says he was apparently a simple personage, clad like themselves in the humble garment of the poor. And so while the priest had clad themselves in expensive robes, Christ himself could easily be missed in the crowds because he had dressed just like the poor people. He had come in like manner that he may save such that were in, in such a state. And so what are the lessons for us to learn in understanding, uh, uh, in the witness of now understanding, uh, the new understanding of, of, the, of the Messiah? Perhaps we have preconceived ideas and notions that we hold dear to us about who the Messiah is. And we, help, we hold so tightly to them that when Christ desires to reveal himself to us, we will not be let loose of these ideas. I pray that today that you may search within your hearts, that you may desire that the Lord may truly, that you may tr have a true conception of who Christ is. And John gives us an idea, uh, gives us, um, begins by telling us that he is the lamp of God. And that is his role first as uh, the lamp that was to be taken to the slaughter, meaning that Christ has died for us. Christ has died for you. And through his death, we find salvation. It says uh, in closing that salvation does not come from worldly philosophy, science, or higher learning. It comes only from God to a heart surrendered in faith and obedience to Jesus Christ. May that be your experience. Amen. Amen. May our hearts also be fully surrendered to Christ. So uh, when we are having this new understanding of the Messiah, uh, this was really hoped that the Israelites, or rather the Jewish people, would actually have this understanding that, you know what, the Messiah that you are waiting for to come and save you from the oppression of Rome is not, he's here with you. Only that the mission that you guys think he's here for is not that mission. His mission is far much bigger than the oppression of the Romans. Um, that brings me to a question, or rather g brings us to this question. How sh can we know the truth about Jesus and he, like this understanding be revealed to us that you know what is the atoning sacrifice 
unless it is revealed to us. How are we able to know it? Christ as our atonement, um, uh, unless, I, going back to where we started from, a man can receive nothing unless mm. it is uh, given to him, it's mm. committed to him. Mm. And Christ as our atonement, the sacrifice for sin, mm. as uh, the substitutionary uh, uh, sacrifice for our sin, is revealed to us when we behold him mm. as as the as the disciples uh, beheld him mm. and so in him that which god had given for the salvation of men mm. remember as nathaniel remember the testimony of nathaniel and philip when philip comes to nathaniel to invite him to christ this revelation how does it happen he says that christ himself tells nathaniel when thou was under the fig tree. I saw thee. Mm. Christ actually mm. comes to us where we are with our prejudices mm. and he wants to give us this revelation of his character. Mm. Paul himself in Galatians chapter 1 verse 12, he says that the ministry that I have, I did not receive it of men, I did not receive it of anything, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there is this idea of Christ himself personally participating in revealing himself to us. Amen. Thank you. Christ will reveal himself to us if we only but seek him. Because Nathaniel was already praying, you know, and Paul also was praying and he was in ministry. So Christ will be revealed to us. We move to something else, acceptance and rejection. This is like a recurring theme in the book of John and through even other um, gospels. And it is something that keeps recurring over and over in the Bible and even in our Christian lives, the acceptance and rejection. And we are going to continue from the story of feeding of the 5,000 that we had uh, earlier on started in lesson two. Uh, so we are going to see more or we're going to have that conversation more, but in respect to acceptance and rejection and Onsongo is going to lead us through that. Indeed, the acceptance and rejection is a uh, acceptance and rejection generally as a theme are, are things uh, that sort of um, identify with the human condition. I believe most of us, if not all of us, crave for acceptance. Mm. Whether we would like to acknowledge it in public or in private mm. is different, but all of us, in one way or another, want to be accepted amongst the beloved and everything. And that, and that also plays in, in part also to like peer pressure. Peer pressure is, is you wanting to fall in line so that you can be accepted by your peers or by those uh, to whom maybe you look up to in one way or another. And so Christ also was uh, God in the flesh, was a human being just like us, and he equally, in equal measure, uh, faced uh, being accepted and also being rejected. And, and there are many lessons that we can learn uh, through, through his experience about how to face acceptance and also how to face uh, rejection. Um, in light of who he is and what his mission and his purpose in life is. Similarly for us also in, our, in your mission and your purpose, in whatever vocation that you have chosen to, to pursue, there are those who will accept you uh, for who you are, either as a doctor or a chimney sweep. And there are those who will reject you because of your social uh, economic status and, uh, and where you are in life. Similarly, Christ faced the same and there are many lessons that we can learn from him. And we borrow back now to the story in John chapter 6, in which Christ has just fed the 5,000. And there was a lot of uh, excitement that he who could do this could indeed be the one to redeem them and to lift them up. But then, in order, uh, we see eventually Christ now says to them uh, in verse 32 of John chapter 6 and verse 32, um, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from where? From heaven. And then he continues and says in verse 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. You see now Christ is, 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 is now breaking it down to them, trying to help them to understand that, that 
his mission and his purpose, as Kola has told us, was beyond the material world, was beyond satisfying um, carnal uh, desires, which, yes, he was there for them at their point of hunger, but beyond that, he wanted to feed the hungering of their souls, that which was more, was more lasting, that bread which is living, not bread which is, which is dying, you know. And so he continues and says in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Also borrowing up to this bread that not only feels us, uh, you know, sometimes bread in and of itself can choke you. If you've ever tried to have uh, bread alone, but he it says it's, it's almost bread that comes with water. You know, you will never hunger, nor will you thirst. Nor will you thirst. And then they, he, he speaks to them and says that he also have seen me and believe not. You know, and now eventually when he comes, the, in verse 41, the Jews start murmuring. And uh, because he has said to them that he is the bread of, is the bread that came where? That came from heaven. Now, eventually now, we catch up with the story in verse 51. Um, and it says, I am the living bread once again, which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread which I give him is my flesh, and which I give for the life of the world. That's an interesting uh, statement. Christ is literally breaking down to these men and women his mission and, in, and his purpose. And he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. You know, in verse 42, these people, these same people already said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he is the bread that has come from heaven? <laughs> you know, they are, they are asking, they are saying, Okay, this man has done wonderful things, but I think he's a madman. Mm. You know, he, something is not okay in his head, you know? Mm. Of course, yes, to, the, to a certain extent, the words that he was saying and the things that he had done were not, were not, uh, were not, uh, were sort of, they were, they were not in congruence with what they wanted, you know, to hear from him. Now he's speaking to them about spiritual matters and he's, speaking, and he's breaking, the, bringing, breaking it down. And he's saying now, drink my blood. You know, in verse 54, whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up, I will raise him up at the last day. Speaking about the last day, speaking about dying, you know, speaking about um, all these things which they didn't want. But eventually, the Bible records um, in verse 59... These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. And in verse 60 says, Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can do what? Who can hear it? Who can hear it? Verse 61 says, Then Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured, and he said unto them, Does this offend you? What then if you see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? And verse 64 says, but there were some of you that believed not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who were they that believed not and, the, and who should betray him. Verse 66 says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Having fed them, he now transitioned to speaking to them about spiritual matters. And they say, this is too much. This is, this is a hard saying. How can we eat a man's bread, a man's body, and drink his, his blood and, and have eternal life? These were, these were things they were not willing. This is not what they are signed up for. They are signed up for, to follow a, a, a physical Messiah, a, a liberator, so to say. One who would lift them uh, from the bondage of Rome and, 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 and its difficulties and would help them in providing their daily bread, you know. And here is one who is saying he wants to give them uh, eternal life. This, for example, uh, this for a fact, broke the heart of Christ, you know. Having had so many followers, having had so many people, you also, you also had hope in all of them, you know. But now, it says, many who had followed him hitherto for, stopped following. In verse, in verse 67, we see Christ himself now asking his disciples, will you also do what? Will you also go away? Acceptance and rejection. Acceptance and rejection. Uh, it's something that we all uh, are faced with. Sometimes in life, we could have those who have accepted us up to that point when we decide to follow Christ, when we decide to make fundamental changes in our lives, when we decide to change our lifestyles, you know, and then suddenly now we are met with challenges and rejection. This is something that Christ was familiar with, you know, and eventually he now even goes to these who are really close to him, these 12, and he asks them, 
will you also go away? Almost opening up the way, maybe they were there because they were afraid. Sometimes there are those people who hung around waiting for an opportunity to, to leave. And now he opens the door. But lo and behold, Simon Peter comes and says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You have the words of eternal life. For all, that, uh, for all of Peter's faults, he always, he always came through. Uh, sometimes uh, when, when, when the moment counted, when he was asking, when men were asking who Christ was, he said, for a fact, you are the Messiah, uh, the Son of God. And now once again, he comes and says, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter, speaking on behalf of the disciples, being a leader, says uh, in verse 69, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living, the living God. And Jesus answered and says, have not I chosen you twelve, but one of you is what? Is the devil. And he spoke of Judas, uh, the son of uh, Simon, Iscariot. For he was he among the twelve who should betray him. When you're talking about acceptance and, re and, and rejection, it is not only um, acceptance of those who accept us, but also acceptance of also those who will betray us. You see, Christ also accepting Judas as among the twelve, among those who had remained, was one whose heart was not aligned completely with his mission and with his purpose. Yet, in the midst of all this, Christ still accepted him. Accepted him to walk with him for three and a half years, and accepted him even when he betrayed him with a kiss. Accepting also the rejection of others, you know, not, 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 not breaking down when others have, 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 have refused to, to walk with us, but rather appreciating those who have accepted us and walking uh, this walk. And so it speaks to us that, uh, in essence, um, Christ was a polarizing figure. And even in our world today, we are wondering what indeed shall we do with this man, Jesus? It is either we accept him or reject him. And even in our decisions, he accepts us with the decisions that we made, that we make a wonderful um, illustration of God's love and of, his, and, 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 and of free will. Mm -hmm. In the midst of all this, le the lesson author also reminds us that the disciples, though they had accepted Christ, had not truly understood his mission. Though that they had accepted him as the Messiah, uh, they had not truly uh, and fathomed who he truly he was. It is only in the light of his crucifixion and later of his resurrection that they truly understood who he was and they fully gave their lives to him, recommitting himself. And so it also tells us that acceptance and rejection is a journey to a certain extent. It is a journey that we embark on slowly by slowly. That having accepted Christ isn't the end of it all. That our convictions of accepting him day by day as he reveals himself and as we interact with scripture, then for a fact we understand more and more about who he is. And we make decisions about uh, who he is. also gives us hope that there are those who perhaps have rejected Christ, but in the light of a better understanding, in the light of better circumstances, of, of deeper Bible study, of deeper revelation, that they will also likewise come to accept this, uh, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Acceptance and rejection. Are, is a journey. They are all like a journey. You, you do not just wake up one day and reject Christ. You do not just wake up one day and accept Christ. The lesson writer says something that I'd love to read in our hearing. The disciples had been with Jesus for a couple of years now, traveling with him, seeing his miracles, hearing his sermons. They knew from experience that there was no one who was comparable to him. He, the conviction had settled in them deeply that without a doubt that even though the situations were not very usual like how can this man tell us to eat his his body you know that sounds so diabolical how can you eat someone else's flesh you know and even though the situations were this unusual this man for sure they believed was the messiah they 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 were like they had gotten to a point of uh, no matter how this man is misunderstood, uh, for us, this is our Messiah. And only after his death and resurrection did they start to understand more and more. It made more sense. It made sense when he was alive. But after the death and resurrection, it made more and more sense. The key is in either acceptance or in rejection. And that brings me to this question. You know, some... Throughout the Bible, we have learned that um, 
the majority are not always right. And even through our social interactions, you might end up standing all alone. A famous book we read while in uh, high school, it's, it ended up with one man standing for the truth. And even after everyone else had re rejected him, and he became to be known as the enemy of the people. So, uh, Myron, I'll just ask, how do we, how can we acquire a moral backbone to stand for what is right, even when everyone else is just like, you know what, you know, how can we overcome peer pressure? I think that is what I'm trying to ask you. Mm. Um, that's a good question. I believe it's not a hidden concept to us that uh, there are disastrous uh, outcomes from a crowd mentality. And I think a, a case in point is during the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, you know, the masses were crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And and to their detriment, they, they, they were killing their savior. And... Um, one important lesson for us to learn uh, as regarding the that the majority are not usually um, that the majority is usually wrong is is such a, a, a case in point. And what is important for us to remember, especially with the aspects of our faith, um, while the Lord desires to save the masses, He does begin by saving individuals, and. We, when you look at the Christian experience and the Christian walk, it is such a very personalized experience. Um, I can just borrow from, when you read First John, I love the beautiful wording, and I know Peter also speaks about the same. And in First John chapter 1, verse 1, again, still the same similar author, he says, you know, we only speak of that which you have heard, that which you have seen, that which we have handled, you know. And he's speaking from a very personal experience. And we know even his writings come from a very personal walk that he had with Christ. And that is the same for us. And a case, uh, and, and just to bring it to our present time, is the importance of an understanding of the peculiar times in which the church exists in, 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 the, in the present day. And we know that uh, it is said that, you know, uh, uh, devious doctrines will be brought into the church um, and we actually do know of, of of wolves that are among the sheep, and these people that seek to um, bring contention within the Church of Christ. And it is very easy for us to f to fall to to their dubious uh, um, actions and and their means. And one thing of importance for us to remember is when you read Revelation uh, chapter 22, verse 17, you know it says, um, and the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst come, and wh whoever will let him take the water of life freely. It's very important because it says, let and come and let him that heareth come. It's a very personalized message. And so for us is to be cautioned not to go by um, the thoughts of the masses or their intentions, but to truly ask of the Lord what is for our work to do in that particular time. As much as Christ endeavors to save the masses, he starts with us individually. And that means that we will be called upon uh, to stand for Christ individually against peer pressure, against the, uh, all the masses that are around us. And it might not be the truth. I pray that when we get to that point, the Lord will depend on you. The witness of the Father, Chris Pyle. points uh, is um, our lesson on Wednesday and it's very interesting that it's as if John is building um, the, the voices that are bearing testimony of the mission of the Messiah and what greater witness can, be, can there be than he who is called the father and in John chapter 5, which is the context, the focus of um, the witness, where the father is bearing witness, uh, the, the whole chapter is actually very powerful in itself. In verse 20, it talks about how the father loves him. He, he, Christ himself 
uh, is bearing witness of the relationship. The father loved the son and assures him all things. And in verse, in fact, verse 19 is quite crucial in John chapter 5. It says that Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing. Uh, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. For oh, for what things soever he does, he this also the son does likewise. Seems like there was this inseparable bond between Christ as he was doing his work on earth and what the father was doing through him. And now in John uh, in now when we come to verse thirty, we see another interesting phase of his mission as a Messiah. Christ himself points to himself and says I, of my own self, I can do nothing. The works that I do, um, as I hear, I judge. My judgment is, is, is just because I seek not my own will, but the, fa the will of the Father which has sent me. I bear witness, and that is verse that one is now quite crucial, that Christ openly says that I can bear, if a man bears witness of himself, it is most likely that his witness is is not true. If you have to go out of your way to bear witness of yourself, Christ says, I will not do that because there is a greater one than any other witness that has been born. That is the witness of my father. And that is what we see in verse in verse uh, 36. He, he starts by saying, but I have a greater witness than that of John. That's John the Baptist. For the works that the works which the Father has given me to do, the same works that I do and bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Verse 37 says that the Father himself has sent me and has borne witness of me. And you have neither had his voice at any time nor seen his ship. Christ here comes out and clearly says that John has borne witness of me. As he, as we have already seen in John chapter three, as as, and but here he says that there is another level of evidence that has been given in my ministry, which is the works that I have done. These works bear witness of me, but much more than the works, the Father Himself bears witness of me. We have seen that in Jordan, at the Jordan, the Father, the Spirit, and the Son were all there bearing witness. The Father and the Spirit were all there bearing witness of Christ as the Messiah. And here Christ is clearly telling that if there is anything that you are going to believe, believe me for the very work's sake. If, 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 there, is, if there is any other evidence that you can, I can give of my ministry, just believe me because of the works that I do. Those bear witness because it's the Father who is working through me. At finally, in fact, the greatest miracle which Christ performed in his, work, in, his, in his ministry, the resurrection of Lazarus in John chapter 11. Uh, immediately in John chapter, uh, in John chapter 12, we see the reaction of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They, the chief priests, they come together and they want actually that because of the power of the miracle Christ had done, they want to extinguish his ministry. What greater witness would I would have been than seeing a dead man rise up? Being risen. But they had been uh, blinded by their prejudices and by their by their and this shows us that the evidence God has given us in his word is greater, is 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 great and is abundant for us to build our faith on Jesus. But even greater than that, in Christ's day, they had a witness of the Father himself speaking. We who live beyond the experience of the disciples, we have no option but to believe in Jesus, to believe the witness God himself has given of Amen. 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 Countless times, God himself confirms that Jesus Christ is the Son. And the witness of the crowd is where we moved. 
and just uh, reemphasizing or reinforcing what Marion told us that before Christ saves the masses, he hopes that he can save us individually. But here we have a case and point where the witness, actually, the crowd actually witnesses that, you know what, Jesus is Christ. And we're going to read the book of John chapter 7 and the title of my Bible is asking, who is he? Rather, the question that the, ans the crowd is going to answer, who is he? I'll read from verse 40 to 44 uh, from the New King James Version. It says, therefore, many from the crowd, when they had this saying, when they had this saying, said, truly, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. Now some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. And knowingly to them, in this division, in these conversations that they are having, trying to know who Christ is, they are actually saying who Christ is. It is so, it, it comes out in a, you know, at the end of the day, you're actually saying who Christ is. He is the Christ. He is the one that comes from the seed of David. As it was prophesied, he was to be born from, uh, in the town of Bethlehem, the city of David. You know, even as these things are causing division, Christ is still confirmed, is still witnessed that, you know what? He is the one that was sent. And this, uh, this is the testimony of the crowd. Perhaps they're testifying because of the things that Jesus has done. And like as Chris Paul has told us that Christ did so much, so many works. And even John testifies, I think the first verse that we read when we were starting that, we are starting this lesson, John told us that there are so many other signs that Jesus performed, but these are the ones that have been written. Clearly, the signs that uh, John is writing to us, the miracle at the pool of Bethesda, the encounter with the woman at the well, they are pointing us to one thing that, you know what, this is the Messiah. And the crowd is eventually accepting that this is the Messiah, even in their division. You know, that is like the most um, surprising thing, or rather the most uh, amazing thing that these people are thinking that they are fighting each other, but really they are accepting, they are witnessing that he is the Christ that we've been waiting for. Maybe the missions that they are, they are having, the prejudices that they are having are overriding them. They are just veiling their sight, but the truth is deep down their hearts, they know that he is the Messiah. And I'm just praying and asking God to help us that we actually witness for him. We actually overcome the prejudices that are around us. We actually put away everything we think we know about Christ and accept him for who he is. Accept him as the savior, as the redeemer, as the one who is coming again and coming back for all of us. He's come, he came as a savior, but he's going to come as a judge. As I keep saying, may we be found standing in the right books with Jesus Christ. And just to conclude our um, lesson discussion, um, which has been really interesting, which has been an eye-opening to us, I love us that um, the panel with us to answer some few questions that we hope will give us a further overview of the lesson. So starting with Marion, why do you think or why is it that even after all the evidence that we have been presented with, still people have had time accepting the truth of that this is Christ, this is the Messiah. Why is it that some people accept and why is it that some people reject this truth? Um, I believe uh, from the uh, beginning, the, it is, as we have said previously, is it's a matter of or a heart issue, essentially. And 
uh, we know that the people had struggled with unbelief uh, from scriptural references we've studied even in previous lessons. And I, th I believe even in similar times as we live in today, it is simply uh, that it's a heart issue and uh, people struggle with unbelief because um, even in spite of uh, overpowering evidences to cause them to um, let go of their unbelief. And so I think for us it is important that we essentially deal with the issue from the root cause. And, and that I will borrow that from the story of Nicodemus, of whom we have seen when he had sought Jesus in the night. And for him, it was told that there was need for him to be born again. And so I believe a remedy to, to su such ills that uh, prevail us is that we may be born again, that we may have that moral rebirth, that we may have that change that... Uh, begins from the heart and that is a work that only God can do for us. That is a work only the Holy Spirit can achieve through us when we allow him to work in our lives. Amen. Amen. May we just raise up in surrender and say that, you know what, I believe, help my unbelief. The other question that I'd ask uh, on Songo, why is it important that we make use of the Bible as our final and ultimate reference for our faith? I think uh, the example of the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Jews in general is an example that, uh, and even of the disciples, you know, um, to a certain extent they were the disciples of John, then when John pointed them to Christ, and he sort of sanctioned and gave them mandate to follow Christ. He allowed them, so they followed. And so, you see, their first, their first interaction of, with the Messiah was by referral. Similarly, for, for, for us also, we may have gotten to where we are, to Adventism, to the truth, by a referral. But that which will sustain us, that which will keep us beyond uh, that initial contact, that initial um, 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 introduction that has led us thus far, which is also by the grace of God, that which will keep us when, when things are thick, when times are hard, is an understanding of who Christ is and, and of his mission and of his purpose and of how he works. And through the Bible, then, we understand the workings of God. Through the story of Job, we understand that Christians can suffer. Through many examples in Scripture, we are comforted in situations which may even shake our faith. And so, uh, beyond the initial uh, grace of God that introduced us to the faith, our faith is truly nourished and sustained, like the disciples would have been if they were acquainted with what Scripture spoke about the Messiah. It is only after Christ had died and resurrected that they truly understood that which the prophets had written. Similarly also, we have the blessing of understanding these things in light of their failures and in light of the disappointment, for example, of 1844. But we also have the advantage of learning from them that we can only sustain ourselves, we can only find our backing in times of need and in times of difficulty, in times of controversy, if we uh, we go beyond uh, preachers and people and fathers and mothers and people who held our hands or books or means mm -hmm. and ultimately only rely on the Bible as our final and ultimate authority in matters of faith. Amen. Okay. Amen. Um, the last question for you, Chris Pai. Why is it important that we recount the things that God has done in our lives to others? It's crucially important mm. because um, as faith, faith is like a muscle. Mm. The more we exercise it, the more we, we, we grow it. And uh, severally throughout scripture, Christ points out to the issue of faith as a seed, as a seed of the kingdom of God. And like the mustard seed starts small and grows. Mm. So our faith may not always be so uh, significant, so um, uh, 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 very, very founded. But though it is small, we must keep uh, we must keep recounting these experiences, keeping in memory. And through that, we are strengthened. And through that, faith grows. And as through and through that, eventually, uh, you know, if, uh, most of the time you can start small, but you do not have to remain small. The God, God, has, God has given us the opportunity 
to recount those experiences and then grow our faith. Amen. 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 Uh, I'd maybe add on to that and say the Samaritan woman's testimony is really just what we should do. You have met the Messiah. You can't keep that to yourself. And I pray that through this study, more testimonies about Jesus, we have been uh, encouraged to stay within the confines of the will of Christ, that we are supposed to bear witness to him that he is truly indeed the Messiah. Not everything else that surrounds us, not our jobs, not our families, not our parents, they will not save us. Christ is the only one who has the ability to save us. Next week, we go to blessed are those who believe, and I pray that you will still be here to join us for that study. I'll ask that Chris Paul to close for us with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you because of your word that we have uh, looked at this morning. Thank you because of the witness that Christ was pointed to. And we pray that, Lord, in our lives we may demonstrate this witness through our, with our words, through our actions. And we pray, Lord, ultimately, Jesus, you may also, as Christ's was glorified of the father you too may in our lives be glorified and be demonstrated as the ultimate object in our experience we thank you so much jesus for your word we pray lord that every listener who has tuned in will be blessed by it we ask for these gifts in jesus name amen